Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon everyone. Welcome to Razak School of Government's 13th webinar. Today's webinar is called Delivering Agile Stability. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items and the structure of our webinar session today. To those who follow this webinar through Zoom, please mute your microphones. We are also broadcasting this webinar live on our Facebook. This webinar session is divided into three segments. First, we will begin with key questions posed to our guest speaker. Then we will answer questions from participants. At any time during the webinar, you may submit your questions to the guest speaker. Just type your questions in the chat and comment section. Please keep your questions short and straightforward. As time allows, we will address as many questions as possible. Lastly, we will then wrap up to this webinar session. This webinar is recorded and you will be able to assess this recording via our Facebook and YouTube page. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Dressler is Professor of Governance at the Ragnar Nux Department at Taltec, Estonia. He's also an honorary professor of University of College London at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose and an associate at the Harvard University's Davis Center. His focus areas are non-Western public administration, particularly South and East Asia public administration, technology and innovation, and public management reform. Professor Wolfgang has a PhD from the University of Marburg and a social science doctorate from Corvinus University of Budapest. In our region, he was a visiting professor at the University of Leia, at Gajah Mada University, at NIDA, at the Lee Kuan Yew School, National University of Singapore. Last fall, he was an Australian New Zealand School of Government visiting scholar. Within civil service, Professor Wolfgang has been an advisor to the President of Estonia, Executive Secretary with the German Science Council during reunification, and as an American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow and Senior Legislative Analyst in the United States Congress. Professor Wolfgang, let us get started. The first question to the guest speaker is, what is Agile stability? Professor Wolfgang? Well, Mr. Ismail, first, let me thank you for the kind introduction, but also for the invitation to the webinar here. It's a really wonderful opportunity to um, wrap up the year academically uh, because we are still in working mode traditionally. Christmas, for those who celebrate, start on Christmas Day, not before, so we still have three days. And it is particularly nice to do it in the beautiful format of the Razak School of Governance, with whom I'm going back uh, over a decade now as far as good cooperation is concerned. So it's an honor, pleasure, and privilege to address all of you, and I'm very happy about the distinguished output of uh, friends and colleagues that I see. But enough of the prefacing, what is agile stability? This is a concept that comes actually from innovation policy, originally speaking. That means it comes from the consideration, what is the role of the state to create an environment that is friendly towards innovation and that uh, creates um, a context in which innovation in the business field is possible. And if you look at that, this is uh, something that uh, my colleagues, Professor Rainer Kattel from UCL and Professor Ed Kikaro, my boss at uh, Taltech, uh, uh, are writing about. It's a project that we're pursuing and that comes out next year in a book with Yale University Press. What we realized is that uh, you need sometimes, if you look at successes of governments, um, um, uh, a stabilizing government that continuously delivers in such a way in which innovation, especially innovation is 
uh, in the business sector is possible. But on the other hand, you see periods and times in which it is necessary that the government itself be very agile, respond to technological changes, to social changes, and so on and so on. And then if you look at that, what was clear is that there is a regularity in the sense that you need agility and stability at the same time. Both are necessary, and this is very difficult. But you need sometimes the one more and sometimes the other more. And it is really important for a public management environment that the ability to switch from one to the other and to do both things synchronously, but, but as well as one after the other is really one of the keys of success. Now, what is very important is that this is not necessarily so just with one institution, but it is about the entire ecosystem. That means if some institutions within a context that we are talking about is more agile and the other one provides the stability, this is fine, but you do need both represented. Um, what is really important here is that the question of what should be at the forefront agility or stability is very context dependent in time and space. So not only temporarily, but also where you are and that there is also something like an evolutionary process or a cyclicality, meaning um, you usually have one in the lead, then the other, then the one and then the other. Uh, what is important then is that this seems not only to be true for innovation policy, but for public administration delivering in general. That means that in all contexts of state and society, what we need is both an agile dimension of the state and a stable one. And that is of course not something we, or let alone I came up with, but it's a general insight that is very, very important. And that is particularly uh, coming to the forefront of thinking this year, because this year is um, on the one hand, the 100th anniversary of the death of Max Weber, who pioneered uh, both the stability focus, which is well known, but also the agility one, which is much less known. Usually the Austrian American economist, Joseph A. Schumpeter is credited with this, but it's actually both in Weber and secondly, um, um, this fortunately is not yet another lecture about COVID-19 and its response, because I think we've had really too many of them. But of course, this is the year of COVID-19. And what we can see is that COVID-19 tests and probes our administrative models. It's not only about building back better later, but it has also checked what we are doing. And this idea about uh, responding well to the crisis is something against which we need to check as much as we can, and we will also in the years to come have to do that, the administrative systems. Let me uh, finish the, the thought about that, that of course, whether you need agile stability in a complex way or not, depends on your view of the state. If you think that the state should just uh, sit back, if you believe in a rentier state, uh, um, uh, if you believe in um, uh, an environment in which everybody else should take the lead, but not the state, this is not so much of a business, but that is not what current understanding of the state is because not only COVID, but the great challenges that we are facing, including the ecological one yeah, and uh, moving to a, a greener globe that the earth can actually shoulder. And so many of these projects are actually large-scale enterprises that state institutions need at least at the very minimum to accompany. Um, we have moved to mission-oriented policy in so many areas. Who is going to conduct that? Who is going to lead? Uh, so these are classic examples in which we can see that uh, the alternative to a badly working administration is not less administration, but better administration. Administrative capacity is an absolute key for our times. And if we are realizing that we need administrative capacity, then we very quickly will come to the understanding that both agility and 
stability are necessary. This is much more difficult, much more complex, much more expensive than a simple state that just either sits there or lets small innovative units go ahead. But it's never about being easy or being cheap, but it's about being right and about being right for our times. And that is what agile stability means. The highly complex tasks of the public sector and the public service today and tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Wolfgang. It's good to know that you are coming with a new book soon. Uh, we're going to the next question, Professor. It's, it reads, what is the impact of having one without the other? Well, if we need both, uh, then uh, either one falls short. Uh, it's not a problem uh, today in today's environment to say that just stability is a bad state. It evokes uh, bureaucrats as just handling things as they come along, uh, gray suited uh, uh, old men who file things in triplicate and never decide anything, go through the motions and just apply the law. So the negative cliche of the overly stable state, which actually sometimes is seen as an overly, uh, overly stable state. So any state, any stability is seen as too much stability in the sense that it doesn't move forward. It's not in sync with our times. It doesn't respond uh, to the challenges. Uh, but um, on the other hand, a purely agile state um, is as well a problem. Uh, um, human beings crave some form of stability. We need some form of generalized service provision. Weber is right with two things. Uh, modern bureaucracy needs to be equitable. It means the same at, uh, in same circumstances, even as far as public sector service provision is concerned. Um, it is also right that um, if I just jump from one project to the other, um, I um, uh, actually do not exercise the knowledges that we have gained from management and economic theory. But uh, to briefly come back to Weber, it is actually not uh, stability that is normal, but it is instability that is normal. As we see this here in human life, we are constantly changing. Just if you look at our faces at the end of every year, uh, dynamics are normal, not stability. Um, yet we crave, as human beings, a form of stability. That means that there needs to be an institution that provides this, that generalizes a human desire, that gives a framework within which to make innovation possible and less, if you will, disruptive on the personal level. So if you're only going for agility, that will also lead to problems. The most famous um, example of a large-scale public management paradigm that went for all agility and no stability was the so-called new public management, which completely privileged a small-scale, um, individualized, um, uh, departmentalized approach. And I think it is fair to say that this is a history of failure. There are not that many protagonists of this school around. And as you know, in Malaysia and Southeast Asia, this was also a big fashion. Everybody ran after these new public management goals and what was seen as an improved way of delivering public services. Mm -hmm. And it didn't fail, but it failed miserably there is very, very few positive examples. As you mentioned, um, delaying things in a negatively bureaucratic way is wrong, but jumping at things with quick fixes and unconsidered um, overly agile decisions is also an issue. Let me allow, you introduced me as giving non-Western PA as one of my uh, <laughs> first interests. And uh, speaking in Malaysia, I will, um, uh, I, I like to bring examples, not only from the uh, global Northern tradition, but also from the other. So 
there is an interesting consideration here from Islamic public administration. And that is that the Holy Quran only mentions one PA principle, really. There is much more in the Hadith and the rightly guided caliphs, but the Quran says one thing, and that is that decisions need to be with counsel. That means when you make a major decision, you need an assembly of people with whom you discuss it. This is the Shura. And that means that you cannot just decide by yourself, no matter who you are, no matter what system it is, but you need to consider it. You need to discuss it with people with experience and a larger view. If this is the number one perspective to, if you will, official decision-making, it shows you how important it is. And that is not only um, a specific, but it's a very generalizable rule, you know, that, that um, as agile as things uh, seem positively to be, the general consideration is possible because already in the short mid run, let alone uh, further than that, it is actually better delivering and um, it is more productive in that sense. Um, Lord uh, Skidelsky, the, the great Keynes biographer wrote, uh, um, um, I think on, 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 on syndicate, the other day, a blog in saying that we need to move away from the simple focus on efficiency because the way we define efficiency today, he meant even in economics, uh, what we mean is short-term efficiency right now, according to the budget line. But we are living in a time where the main worry is about sustainability and equity in a longer perspective than we've seen today. And for this one, if you look at it this way, I think it becomes very clear of why the combination of both is necessary and while not only overly stable bureaucracy only leads to undesirable results, but also overly agile, day success oriented, quick fix approaches. We cannot have one without the other. These are the yin and yang of public administration and we do need to look at a, at a holistic combination and at a proper balance. Uh, in short, if we gather you correctly, Professor, uh, we must have both in, in administration. And it is uh, profound of you to mention about the need to, con to, to counsel to, before we reach certain decision. Uh, our third question, Professor, how can we develop an agile and stable civil service? That is one of the big questions of our time indeed, because it is about the quality of the civil service, whereas we did have something of a fashion in which, as I said, uh, criticism of the civil service was met with the idea to reduce it, cut it down, or have it less so. But that is exactly the wrong policy for our times. In the current context, I could say that the key to having a civil service that can deliver agile stability is a context in which the best people join the civil service and in which they are oriented towards the common good, the great missions and the, um, the equity that needs to provide it to the people. So uh, the search is for the best people to actually join the civil service and to keep them focused on their missions. In other words, what is needed for getting both is a high quality Razak school of government that does these kind of things, if I may put it this way. But let me again from the non-Western perspective say that this focus on how to get the best people into the civil service and keep them on track the answer is the classical Chinese one because the entire project of the Chinese empire has been not uh, to um, uh, stump out the private service, but to say that normal people want to go into money making and trade and other things like that. How can we create an environment in which we get really good, really good motivated people into the civil service? And the entire idea of the Chinese civil service exam, the old imperial civil service exam, which was so important for human existence is really uh, there. What we can say is that 
It is exactly wrong to demotivate civil servants, but to keep them on track via motivation, not via uh, little fulfillments of KPI every six months, which makes no sense from the Chinese tradition we know since a thousand years that this is a wrong policy, but as far as overall success is concerned. That means um, the, um, the mindset of civil servants needs to be um, the success in the long-term missions and in the overall happiness of the people. It's not easy to do this, how to get good people, responsible and people oriented into the civil service is the big price. But again, it's really important to have it. What we can say from comparison is that it is absolutely important that to have a top level civil service is also a top level priority in government. If you do not have full support from the political leadership, long-term political support, if there are no populist uh, weasel decisions, such as blaming all the problems of society on the bureaucracy from the top, which is an easy way out, um, then uh, we have a really um, a problematic approach. So um, the demotivating of the civil service is really um, uh, important here. And that gets us to a thing the fashionable and the normal thing is to whine about the civil service. If you read social media in almost every country, complaints about the civil service, even in countries of the very best civil service, mm -hmm. are ubiquitous. They are very normal. Um, this is part of the human sound because a good civil service will always um, have an impact on people's lives and people want what they want. They don't want to be told, go back to the line, it's not your turn yet. So, on the other hand, what people also want is a functioning state that, that keeps them stable, the warm water running, the other armies out of the country, and so on and so on. So it is what we describe as a wicked problem. People want all the best civil service delivery, and they would prefer uh, not that much and not that much well-paid civil service. They don't realize you can't have both. Um, it is important to not only insist on stability, we do live in a technological age. I do want to say at that point that I do think that times for uh, non-internet literate civil servants are over. Mm -hmm. If you give civil servants that much of an opportunity, you also have a very high level of duties and obligations. But um, I think the setting of clear goals overall goals and missions and an orientation of the civil service towards delivering those and checking what they're doing according to the fulfillment of these large um, um, goals, if you will, is the main um, avenue of how to go if in the long run you want to have a high quality public sphere and a high quality living uh, together. I was um, at um, uh, the IRSPM conference. This is one of the public management conferences in New Zealand last year on the main panel about the development of the civil service. And what I was very impressed with is that the main speaker on our panel was the State Services Commissioner of New Zealand. And um, the older ones of you remember, New Zealand was once the leading NPM country. They did everything with contracting out and consulting companies and everything like that. And some people who don't know what's happened still use them as an example. Although New Zealand has completely switched around and um, provided the delivery and provided the proper focus of the civil servants, um, the following, I think, is a really good approach. What the State Services Commissioner of New Zealand said is, whenever I meet a civil servant, I go to them and I shake their hand and I say, thank you. That is, for many, a radical statement, but I do think how to get agile stability is to, how, is to move forward to a system where the leadership does automatically 
say thank you to the civil servants, but also where the civil servants deserve by their achievements, their motivations, to be thanked. Professor, we have started to receive questions from the participant. I read the first one to you, it's from Mr. Iqbal. His question, could you share an example of a could you share an example of a contemporary civil service that is currently exhibiting agile stability? Oh, I think that um, uh, you can even flop it. You can, you can say that uh, civil services that have uh, responded uh, well uh, to the COVID-19 challenge are the ones that were agile and stable, that had the long-term knowledge and the long-term um, depository of how to technically deal with large pandemics, but to jump at the same time in and develop um, solutions specific to this one. Uh, sometimes it's said that all the civil services that went through coping with SARS and MERS were the most successful, but in order, in order to cope with this and store the information of how to do it, you need to have both stability and then now the agility to respond quickly. So I would actually say that um, um, all civil services are in flux right now. Um, they are going into the one direction, more agile stability, or into the other, they are weakening. But I would say that um, today, um, some of the best uh, civil services that combine the both is the aforementioned New Zealand. Um, I would also add, uh, um, I know this is a loaded answer in Malaysia, but I am afraid I would have to mention Singapore here. Uh, this is not the best environment to praise Singapore, I know that. But um, the idea to um, exactly this combination of agility and stability was very important here. Um, I would say that um, uh, without being conscious about it, it is living from the uh, stable legacy, but now overemphasizing agility a bit, still you have an agile stability right now is Taiwan. This is a classic example with a very, very stable system that is right now, as I said, under threat, upon which then the agility is framed. Yeah, I think I would say that um, these are three uh, good examples I would give right now. Thank you for the example, Professor. Professor, you mentioned about people that will eventually deliver this agile stability in the public mm -hmm. service. I have two questions. What kind of people that you need to recruit into the public service to ensure we can achieve agile stability? And secondly, this is for the benefit of Razak School as a training provider. What kind of training do you think is, uh, is necessary to, to produce public officers that would be able to deliver agile stability? You know, I do think that um, uh, not everybody can do everything at the same time. Uh, we in academe, as professors, we are usually said you need to teach well, you need to do high quality research, you need to advise graduate students, you need to fundraise, and you need to consult for the public or for whoever is in your field. But you don't get that. You usually, if you get people who do two of these things right, this is the same. I don't think that every single civil servant needs to be predestined for stability and agility at the same time. I do think that the leadership needs to know, both the political one and the one in the civil service, that you need to have both and that it needs to be an ecosystem for both. Uh, you do need to recruit people that do well in an iLab, but you also need to recruit people who do well in line and they need to be informed, both of them need to be informed that the others are not challenging their lives, but that you are, if you will, co-producing um, the, the good life in the good state via agile stability. Optimally, yes, we have civil servants who can do both and understand both. That means to have the insight in both. 
So the training at RSOC, I would expect to have both uh, classes in spot on project management and highly digitalized affairs and so on and so on. But on the other hand, who are also taught about the validity of classical responsible and responsive bureaucracy of which I should really say both in its Western and in its local tradition, Malaysia has a great background. Malaysia is not a country that needs to look for radically new systems outside of its own legacy, I think. This is why, and then one should really emphasize, Malaysia is an overly um, um, uh, needy country as far as radically new solutions is concerned. So this is a tricky, um, uh, this is a tricky story. I do think that the old Chinese answer is correct. It is normal that the best people do not want to join the civil service and therefore we do need a system, an infrastructure, a mindset in which truly motivated and competent high achievers actually want to join the civil service. Now, why am I saying this now? Because, and I, I see this already in the questions coming up, because, um, and, and this is what you usually get, uh, many people do criticize uh, in our world, the stability side and try to emphasize the agility. But I think that we have reached the point on the level, for instance, of this seminar to remind ourselves how important the stability is. You know, the agility doesn't need any defenders right now. This is the logic, this is the normal, this is what everybody is saying. But right now, I feel is the time to remind ourselves that in spite of the high costs on all levels, there is still an incredible value in the truly motivated, truly goal-oriented and mission-oriented stability. So this is my answer to the first question. It's a very good res response, Professor. It brings us to the next question from Mr. Ramli. In the Malaysian context, the civil service is huge and overly centralized. To ensure agile stability, we need to empower and decentralize. What is your view, Professor? Uh, empower, yes, decentralize is completely context dependent. I think that um, one of the things we have learned in the half uh, or quarter century that we've had um, and um, what uh, we have seen is that there is almost no automatic logic to the one or the other. It depends on what you want to do. There are also systems in which decentralization leads to highly undesirable results. We have had examples, for instance, in Latin America, where the central government did embody the will of the majority of the people and certain positive reforms, whereas in various of the provinces, you had basically local warlords and large mafia institutions that ran these. So, but altogether, I would agree that um, the, the, let me put it like this, the overall tendency is that decentralization is a good idea because in large countries, the more you contextualize on the regional level and on the local level, the closer you bring the decision-making to the specific people involved, the better. Also in a decentralized environment, um, there is, if you will, what in the municipal autonomy theory in Germany since the year 1800 was the emphasis that it starts civic engagement and bureaucracy on the local level and it builds from there up to the regional one. Now, um, to say that uh, Malaysia is overly centralized, um, as, as you've heard, I have some area competence in Malaysia, but certainly not as much as most people in, in the current context. What one can say, of course, is that the basic structure of Malaysia is federal and it has logical, historical loki of power, decision-making, authority, and legitimacy on a regional level. So if in any environment it would be possible to regionally decentralize, Malaysia would be one of the first bets rather than certain unitary states that we also find in Southeast Asia who don't have this logic. Yeah? For instance, 
um, uh, the um, uh, continental Southeast Asia countries uh, up to the north of Malaysia, exactly up to the north actually across the border are uh, by the national logic highly centralized, whereas Malaysia is not. I should say this about the centralization, decentralization, and the civil service question about being too huge. For me, whether a civil service is too big, too small, or right-sized is entirely dependent on what it delivers. So the size of the civil service is something that 25, 30 years ago was a point of criticism, just like the size of the community. Whereas today we would say, um, the question is how well the current kind of civil service delivers. If I have 10% of the working populace working for the civil service, but it contributes to national economy and national development, say 15 to 20%, I will say, great. Uh, we have many examples of uh, civil services that were very large, that run the country via state-owned enterprises and so on, and that were very productive. The current fashion is to say, no, um, this, or actually not the current fashion, but the fashion of yesterday, is to say, no, we need to cut this down, we need to privatize, we need to outsource, but there is no automatic logic here. The question is, does the current system deliver or not? And if it doesn't deliver what we need it to deliver, then we can ask about the who, the what, and the how many. So in the purity of the number, of the size, um, there lies no value whatsoever. The value for our consideration comes once we look at what it does that we do have civil servants that park people who are not great achievers in other spheres. So they're basically giant retirement homes or monasteries. Indeed, that is a pathology and that should not happen, but that has not to do with the size. You also get incompetent monastery-like civil services that are not that big, but that they're rather small and still they are not doing their job well. Thank you, Professor. Professor, before we move into the, the, the subsequent question, you, we have two messages here for you. One from Dato' Noma Manso. He say, hi, Wolfgang, spot on. Messages are very profound and clear. Congratulations from Norma. And Thank you so much, Dato' Norma. And we also have this from Mr. Chandara Samban. Uh, he want to tell you that he comes from, from Cambodia, the small part of ASEAN, and uh, currently following this, this webinar. Okay, well, Cambodia is uh, uh, maybe small today, but it used to be extremely big, as you know, in history, the Khmer Empire. And it is uh, the Khmer Empire under some of the, the leading kings in, in Cambodia are one of the best examples of a highly responsible and responsive motivation-based and social well-being based administration. This is a long ago uh, example, but it's an important example if we look for uh, top uh, models for a well-delivering civil service. Thank you. Professor, uh, can, the next question is from Mr. Morali Reddy. He mm -hmm. asks you, how can government not lose focus on long-term developmental reforms? if agile stability is not strategized properly. For example, plan to revival of tourism and hospitality industries due to decision taken for mitigating crisis during the pandemic. Agile stability um, doesn't guarantee long-term planning and how to keep bureaucrats on message and on motivation is the big question. Uh, the, uh, so if you have agile stability, Mr. Reddy is uh, absolutely right. Um, that's not, uh, that as a framework, if you will, um, is, is not a guarantee, um, but it needs to be flushing out and it needs the setting and keeping people on message. And of course, once again, the um, classic Chinese solution is to have a system in which the self-identification of the civil services with the large scale mission and overall societal approaches 
are the key of the ecosystem in which we operate over a very long term so that it keeps you on track. And that, of course, needs to be fueled. And that, of course, needs to be supported. So um, obviously, um, just delivering agile stability is not enough. But once we are able to do this, formulate these goals and move ahead in this direction with the possibility, as I say, to change um, uh, at various times for one to take the lead or the other take the lead, then if I do large scale strategizing, um, at least I have the chance to fulfill this as well. Whereas if I only have one or the other, I have a much lesser chance to go ahead. And of course, if stability is done well, what stability hopefully does is that it um, perpetuates a focus on the actual missions, on the actual societal fulfillment. That is the, um, uh, that is the prospect here. Uh, professor, the next question from is Mr. from Mr. Krishnan. He asks you, what is your view on lack of an analytical framework in civil service? Oh, I think analytical frameworks in civil service are a dime a dozen wherever you go. Even consultancies can you provide with that. Um, uh, so um, that's that's not the problem. The question is which one to choose. You know, and what is what is the consensus? Do I take all the considerations uh, 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 in? Uh, do I realize that the civil service is uniquely different and cannot work uh, according to the business logic because it's just so profoundly different? And if we agree that managerial structures have to do with the goals and the missions of the organization, both as a whole and the smaller institutions, then we know that we cannot borrow. Uh, do we have the people to deliver this? Um, uh, is the political leadership able to keep uh, with the wicked problem of how to have an optimal service in the mid and long term and not only for quick fixes and so on and so on? So I think that um, the um, uh, the analytical framework is, again, something that needs to be made um, a large level of consensus of all the stakeholders involved, uh, an acute awareness of where, where we are in space and time, and the um, uh, capacity to withstand outside pressures that come from the fact of, uh, of it being a wicked problem in the end. Professor, Mr. Chandara Samvan asks you, can you explain how civil service look like in Malaysia in next 10 years? I wish I could, but as they say, my crystal ball is not that clear today. So 10 years is a very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very long time. I mean, if you look at, if we would have speculated how things look uh, last year, if we would have had this seminar in December 2019, we wouldn't have known how rapidly the world changes. But um, uh, I think, and, and, and in Malaysia, there is, a, there is a lot of variables of which we don't know. Also, as far as the prioritizing of high quality civil service from the political level is concerned. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it really depends on, on, on who is going to say what. Um, I do feel particularly um, squeamish to, to, to answer Mr. Chandra's question because that would assume more of a thorough knowledge of Malaysia than I actually do have. And the worst civil service reform initiatives have come from international advisors, consultancies, or organizations coming to countries they don't fully understand and then recommending certain fashion items of how to go. This has probably wrecked more administrative capacity than anything else. Um, I do think that the potential of Malaysia for a properly decentralized, truly consensual, and very much agile stability-based solution that emphasizes both, for instance, the challenges of the digital age and the possibility of a large-scale orientation are quite high. The question is whether this 
can be successful. And I think once again, that Razak School of Governance will play an important part in making sure that it does. You really appreciate your response, Professor. Uh, <laughs> we're going to move to the next question from Hairia. He asked you, earlier, Professor, you mentioned consensus or the Shura as central to decision making. In times where stakeholders have competing interests and stakes are high, how can government ease this process? Is there a trick to get everyone on board? Well, um, I think I, I mean, now we really get into the non-Western idea. Um, the, um, the idea of how to get a consensus, how to get everybody on board of insight of a common good is tricky as long as we do have society in which actors have different interests. So to abstract on the level of a right perceived common good and then to against particular interests um, uh, administer that through with a positive outcome, that is actually the German philosopher GWF Hegel's definition of bureaucracy. Yeah, so this is a challenge that we have. And you know, he has, um, what was it now? I think uh, 250th birthday was, was celebrated. Now, the, um, uh, the important thing for uh, the Shura concept, I think if we look at the Shura concept in itself, is not necessarily that there needs to be a consensus amongst the councillors and that then whoever is the executive needs to decide according to this rule. But Islamic tradition has it that um, you don't need to have a vote amongst these and then do that, but you do need to listen. So it is already an important step if we move um, towards the recognition of expert and experience advice and to say that um, stability comes to taking into consideration what um, experience and expertise, if you will, teach you. This is already a lot. And this is that you can, um, this kind of uh, consensus talk that you have, most of these council rooms in the tradition of the palaces are really very interactive, you know, with the benches along the walls. It's really this kind of caucus architecture that can tell you the finding um, the way of how to consult on a relatively equitable way. It's a real, real contribution to decision-making, especially in the public sector. So um, uh, there is no magic bullet. Uh, high quality public service delivery is one of the great prizes of structured human living together in time and space since literally thousands of years and all over the world. Um, this is why if we get it right, um, it's usually in a highly happy and or highly powerful environments. And to go uh, close to there is already um, a big achievement. It's, um, I'm not saying this is easy and I'm not saying uh, this comes cheap, but uh, the returns you get from it are just so high. Professor, if I can rewind to your... To, to to the earlier question by Encik Ramli about the decentralization. Uh, how, how best do you think this decentralization can be managed in public service? Well, um, that is so completely context dependent. And what you mean with decentralization? Does, for instance, the decentralization come with a um, governance decentralization as well, or is it within a unitary civil service? These are two completely different questions. They're not related. And then if you're talking about a municipal civil service that is not part of the state and uh, federal civil service, again, it's an entire different question completely. And we see both in high achiever and low achiever countries, if you will, both models or, 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 or a difference of, of models. The um, the uh, importance for the decentralization lies in a way in the history of the concept of subsidiarity, but it doesn't help us on a, on a concrete level. Subsidiarity, that means um, that any decision should be made as close as possible to 
the problem at hand or the people involved. Yeah? Um, what it means translated is that um, I try to make the decision uh, at the smallest or lowest unit available. But mm -hmm. what is the smallest or, unit, uh, 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 smallest or lowest level depends on the government setup. What it also means, though, is that it is important not to delegate decisions that cannot be made on this level, but that uh, coordination, um, financial oversight, and so on and so on are retained on a higher level where this is possible, because you can also overdo this. Um, the great German issue was with uh, two autonomous municipalities that then ran up huge debts mm -hmm. by establishing public infrastructure like giant indoor swimming pools that they could not afford and for which, however, the state government then needed to jump in and pay the bill. So if um, that for me is a classic example where, although I'm basically very much for local autonomy, some kind of centralized over um, site is necessary. So what I am saying is um, the key to good devolution is that you devolve what in a unitary system now, that you devolve what can be devolved, but right. you are very careful that this is uh, closely connected to the financial decision making as well, and the financial oversight, and that you do not devolve things in which unitary um, generalized decisions still are necessary for delivering an equitable life in the given context. Now, if you say that this is more or less a truism, right. yes, it is, but there is not more than you can actually say because anything more I could say would be so context dependent that we needed to have other clear information about the system and the ecosystem we would be addressing. Thank you, Professor. You just share very, a few important questions that that the public officers can can apply whenever they they want to to make some decision relating to decentralization. Uh, professor, you live in Germany. You live in Europe, the European okay, the Euro, Europe European Union. Yeah. Uh, how does this deliver agile stability works in European Union uh, during the the pandemic this year, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a very big question and also one, um, yeah, um, what, what we, um, how, how successful was the European Union uh, or is the European Union in the pandemic? Uh, the, um, uh, the easy way out of this question would be to say that it's too early to tell. Uh, because we are right now in this kind of um, process. As you know, um, uh, the European Union has not approved the vaccines yet, whereas in the United States and in the UK, they are already approved. Although historically speaking, and I now mean the history of 2020, the US and the UK had probably the worst pandemic response in the global north at all. They are what John Halligan calls failed states on this level, right? Um, and, and, you know, of course, uh, both the UK and the US in their current regimes overemphasize stability, which, however, they uh, overemphasize, I'm sorry, agility. agility, which they, however, cannot deliver, mm -hmm. and they de-emphasize the stability that is needed um, and that both systems used to have to a considerable extent. As far as the European Union is concerned, of course, the European civil service system is a combination of both, but it reacts always a little bit late. And the problem with the European civil service is that the European Union is not only a, um, a state-like edifice, but also a diplomatic scenario, such as the United Nations. That means the member countries have all these vanities and problems and uh, issues and uh, hang-ups that you need to take into consideration within decision-making. Altogether, there used to be an overemphasis of, uh, of the emphasis of the EU on stability, that is for sure. Um, what is interesting is that overall, um, also there are inroads into this, um, there is an official policy of the EU that civil service and civil service reform 
other than the EU bureaucracy in itself is not the business of the EU. So there is relatively little other than very vague recommendations from the EU coming to the national or then state and local civil services. Of course, the influence is big, seeing the funding, seeing the general draw, but there is no uh, direct impact rather than giving models or general recommendations. Um, as far as um, uh, the pandemic reform is concerned, my diplomatic response will be uh, that it seems to be too early to mm. give a lot of credit to the EU for a both stable and agile pandemic response. Thank you, Professor. That's certainly uh, good input to other regional integration caucus like us here. Uh, Professor, we have come to, to the end of today's session. Before we end, Professor, would you like to offer some parting words to the participant? Well, um, I do appreciate uh, people taking up the time once again, for many, it is the pre-holiday season and to have uh, the Monday afternoon or here in Europe, actually, the, the Monday morning on, on such an issue that maybe not everybody sees as totally exciting um, is a certain effort. But um, I think that uh, considering in the sense of insight, both the agility and the stability is even if you don't agree that we need both at the same time, a helpful criterion, a helpful perspective on civil re uh, uh, service reform. It is important that you look um, at successful civil services that exist. If you um, look at from where to learn, not benchmark, benchmark is an old fashioned term, but um, at, at areas countries, systems from which you can learn something and realize that there is an interplay between the agile and the stable. In the end, um, a high quality civil service is not self-referential, but it is, and we see that in the pandemic as well as otherwise, a foundation of the good life in the good state. It is a key requirement for the people to live well, and it is worth all our efforts uh, to consider again and again and think about as much as we can of how to optimally structure the public sector. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Wolfgang, for spending time with us today. We wish you good health to you and your family. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and your family and a Happy New Year. We hope The to same to you and to all the participants. Hope to keep in touch with you, Professor. Absolutely. We also would like to thank the particip participant for taking part. We value your views and feedback. Uh, we wish you also Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. RSUG webinar will take a break uh, and will resume the new series in January 2021. Please follow us on social media for future session. Till we meet again, take care, stay safe, happy holidays and see you in 2021. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.